It's really hard to know how to define a cornerstone asset, right? I mean, in Dynasty Leagues, you obviously have a vast array of players that you can build your team around. You can decide to go with a win-now approach. You can stack up Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, go grab Joe Mixon at a discount, or you can go through and say, you know what, man? No, I, I'm only going to go with rookies. I'm only going to go through and grab guys like Devon A. Chain, Jameer Gibbs, and try to build for the long term that way. Well, when I'm defining a cornerstone asset here, I want to be including running backs that can actually increase their dynasty value going into next season. Because it doesn't matter if Saquon Barkley, who's now going into year five of his NFL career, goes out there and posts, say, a uh, top three running back finish this next year. Saquon Barkley will still be either worth the same or less in Dynasty Fantasy Football next offseason compared to where he is now just because how Dynasty owners treat these running backs once they get to a certain age. So what I wanted to do is I headed over to flockfantasy.com, pulled up my rankings, and then filtered down to running backs that were 24 years old or younger. So we're going to be looking at running backs that are 24 or younger. Now, don't go to the comment section and go, oh my gosh, how is Christian McCaffrey not here? How is Saquon Barkley not here? And I have a big ask from you. I know people are going to skip this intro and people are going to go down and yell at me in the comment section. Can you please go down, reply to those comments, and make fun of them? Please, help me out here. Explain to them what's going on. But before we get into it, go down there, drop a like on it. Subscribe to the channel if you play Dynasty Fantasy Football. And of course, if you want to get access to all my Dynasty Fantasy Football rankings and all the rankings of your favorite content creators, you can find all of that on flockfantasy.com. When you sign up for flockfantasy.com with the link in the description or the comment section, you're going to get 30% off any subscription and yours truly will go through and break down your Dynasty team with promo code flock. So make sure you're taking advantage of that. But I think that should be about it. Let's go ahead and let's dive into tier one here. And let's look at Bijan Robinson. Now with Bijan, the man's obviously a rookie. I mean, we're drafting him and you are going to be building your team around him for the long, long haul. Now what's very interesting is this is the first time we've seen this since Saquon Barkley. The first time that we've seen a rookie running back in redraft leagues, not just dynasty leagues, but redraft leagues be drafted as a top three option at the position. Now, you've had Saquon Barkley back in 2018. You had Clyde Edwards-Alaire in 2020 being round one redraft picks overall. Now, with Clyde Edwards-Alaire, the reason that I think that everybody went off the rails there wasn't necessarily because everybody viewed Clyde Edwards-Alaire as an elite running back going into the season, going into the NFL draft, and then he found a good landing spot and everybody was like, okay, well, we knew this was the guy. We knew this was the landing spot. Let's go through and let's go all in. The reason people went all in on Clyde Edwards-Alaire was simply the landing spot. Nobody believed that Clyde Edwards-Alaire had that level of talent. Nobody believed that Clyde Edwards-Alaire was an elite prospect such as Saquon Barkley or Bijan Robinson. So now when I'm going over to underdog and you're seeing that Bijan Robinson is legitimately the second running back off draft boards in redraft leagues only behind Christian McCaffrey, that tells us that Hell, if you're going to get the running back two in fantasy this season as a rookie, he is one of the best dynasty fantasy football assets you can find. I think that he is in his own tier among all running backs in dynasty right now. I think if you were to play in a one quarterback dynasty league, where obviously quarterbacks aren't going to be at the very top, Bijan Robinson would be the third most valuable player overall. If you go to flockfantasy.com right now and look at my one quarterback dynasty rankings, you'll see the only players I have ahead of Bijan Robinson are Justin Jefferson as well as Jamar Chase. Like, this is someone you want to build your team around. And if you are going to sell the 101, you better be getting everything in return. Now, going over to our next guy, we're going to be looking at the 101 from last season here in Brees Hall. Now, if you're looking at Brees Hall, yes, 100%. This is a running back that you have to be concerned about the beginning of this next year, right? I mean, I've made the mistake time and time again going through and drafting a running back coming off a torn ACL saying, yeah, you know what? I mean, hell, he tore it 10 months ago. It's a nine-month recovery process. He'll be good to go. In reality, that's not always the case. In reality, it's a little more gray than black and white when we're looking at running backs coming off torn ACLs. 
But what I love about Brees Hall is not only will this New York Jets offense be significantly better with Aaron Rodgers versus Zach Wilson. Trust me, I don't know how good Rodgers is at this point, but I know how bad Zach Wilson was last year. On top of this, with Brees Hall, before the torn ACL, he was second in the NFL at one point, only behind Austin Eckler in targets at the running back position. He was an elite prospect coming out. I mean, we had him scored up there alongside guys like Ezekiel Elliott as prospects. He checked every single box. He was an elite athlete. He had the size to be a bell cow. He was a great pass catcher in college. He got the NFL draft capital that we looked for. He had everything, right? So if we're looking at an elite prospect that is going to be in an improving offense that is one of the better passing down running backs in the entire NFL, this is someone that I'm willing to bet on, but Full transparency, you have to be a little concerned with him coming off the torn ACL, and that's why he will not be in the same tier as Bijan Robinson at this point. Now, going down to our next tier, I have a difficult time knowing if we should move Hall to three because Taylor at three here is, in my mind, definitely behind Brees Hall. But it's more so, while they're kind of similar, should they be in the same tier? The reason I'm going to put Taylor down here at three is if I were to be a rebuilding dynasty team, I'm going to be looking to sell Jonathan Taylor, right? I mean, yeah, Jonathan Taylor will be more productive this next season. And yeah, Jonathan Taylor is still only 24 years old, so he's going to make this list. But at the same time, if we were to go through our little test there and we were to say, okay, well, if Jonathan Taylor is the running back three from a points per game perspective this next season, is he worth more, less, or the same in Dynasty next offseason when he'll be going into year four of his NFL career? I think he would probably be worth just slightly more, but primarily about the same. Whereas if you're looking at Brees Hall, Brees Hall goes out there and puts up that monstrous season. I think you could see Brees Hall continue to climb in dynasty rankings. So that's why I think that if you are a contending roster, you would look to go through and look to sell Jonathan Taylor. But nonetheless, I think we are going to have to just look at him as a cornerstone piece in that you can build a contending team around him, and use him for years and years and years to come. Now, going over to our next guy, we're going to be looking at Travis Etienne. Now, with Etienne, I mean, over there on underdog for 2023, he's being drafted in like the late third, beginning of the fourth round. So he'll probably be one of my most drafted running backs from a redraft perspective. But if we're looking at the Travis Etienne profile, one thing that I really want to be tracking this next season is the level of involvement that he has as a pass catcher. Because what we actually saw with Travis Etienne, who was a phenomenal passing down running back his final season at Clemson, is Etienne didn't really get involved too much as a pass catcher this past season. You're looking at a running back that had 45 targets through the course of 17 games. He was averaging about two receptions a game. And if we're going to compare this to what you had with Travis Etienne at Clemson, and keep in mind, generally you don't have running backs racking up a ton of targets in college. Generally you don't have running backs being used as much as receiving down options until they get to the NFL. But with Travis Etienne, the man in college had 48 receptions in 12 games. So he went from averaging four targets a game at Clemson, I apologize, four receptions a game at Clemson, to now all of a sudden down there at about two receptions a game in the NFL. I think that his level of involvement as a pass catcher can continue to climb. And that's why, hell, right now when he's being drafted as like a running back two on underdog, I'm taking him over and over and over again. And from a dynasty perspective, he's going into year three. Now, he's not as young as what you have with guys like Brees Hall, B. John Robinson, obviously. One thing I need to point out with Travis Etienne is it's a running back that stayed all four years at Clemson. So he's going to be a little bit older than you would naturally assume. But still, I think he'll be productive this year. And I think at the same time, if he were to go out there and be like a top three running back in fantasy, his dynasty value can climb. I'm going into next off season, but now going over to someone else that, you know what? I'm going to make the swap right now. Jameer Gibbs, we have to have him over Travis Etienne, right? Because if we're going and looking at redraft leagues and looking at where these running backs are being drafted for their year one expectations right now, Jameer Gibbs and Travis Etienne are essentially back-to-back picks in underdog drafts. And if we think about this, if both these running backs project to be low-end RB1s, high-end RB2s for 2023, and you're looking at Jameer Gibbs as a significantly younger option, I mean, right now, you're looking at Travis Etienne going into his age 24 season, whereas Jameer Gibbs is going into his age 21 season. I will flip him. I'll move Gibbs over Etienne. Now, with Jameer Gibbs, what you like about the profile, the receiving down skill set, the draft capital he gets being the 12th overall selection, the elite offensive line that he gets to run behind, and the fact that his quarterback is not necessarily one of these guys that 
going to be able to escape the pocket, avoid pressure, and run to pick up first downs on his own. Instead, with Jared Goff, the second that pocket collapses, he'll be looking to check the ball down to the running back out of the backfield. So with Jameer Gibbs, I mean, I think that he should probably be viewed as a high-end RB2 in year one. And if he goes out there and say he hits just this underdog ADP right now in dynasty leagues next off season, this is a running back that will most likely vault up to being like a second, uh, maybe early third round startup pick. But real quick, of course, if you want to get in a draft, y'all know we're drafting on underdog literally every single day on the live stream. You can still go sign up. It's the link in the description. Promo code flock will get you a 100% deposit match. And if you're a member of both flockfantasy.com and underdog fantasy, you are going to have some exclusive merch going your way very, very soon. And on top of that, some extra underdog credit being applied to your account very, very soon. But excited about that now. Going over to our next tier, we're going to be looking at Kenneth Walker at six. And yes, I'll be the first person to admit, before the NFL draft, I did have Kenneth Walker significantly higher than this. I had Kenneth Walker as, I mean, a locked and loaded top five running back in Dynasty before the NFL draft. But for us to see the Seattle Seahawks go through and draft Zach Charbonnet in round two, you can't really ignore it, right? I mean, we have to sit here and go, okay, well, this tells us what the Seattle Seahawks Think of Kenneth Walker and with how damn good Zach Charbonnet is, I mean, if they're willing to take him in round two, this is, will not be a running back one, running back two type situation. This instead will be a running back one A and a running back one B type situation, which is why Zach Charbonnet is going to be higher in our rankings, which you'll see in one second than a lot of others. Now, going over to our next guy, we're going to have Damian Pierce at seven. He was a buy-low candidate for us before the NFL draft just because we were looking at the actions the Houston Texans have taken. We were saying, okay, yeah, um, they signed Devin Singletary to be a backup. It looks like Damian Pierce is probably safe this next year, and it will be an improved offense compared to where they were in 2022. So, yeah, let's go through. Let's buy low on Damian Pierce, and I'm going to be completely fine going through and saying, yeah, Damian Pierce is still someone that I want to go ahead and build around. And, yes, I understand Back in his rookie year, whenever he was surging, whenever he had more dynasty value than Saquon Barkley at one point, we said to sell. But he is no longer viewed as that top five running back in dynasty. I think he's a very obtainable price. I'd be completely fine going after him. Now, at eight, we're going to have Javante Williams. News came out today that Javante Williams may avoid the PUP. And that is phenomenal news, right? Like baseline expectation right now, if you're looking at the recovery process, it took J.K. Dobbins for a similar injury is that Javante Williams is not going to be back until late October, early November. So if instead Javante is able to somehow start the season, he will move up these rankings. Now, of course, I have to be realistic and saying, while Javante Williams has upside, at the end of the day, we've never seen him be a three-down running back. In college, he split with Michael Carter Jr. In the NFL so far, he split with Melvin Gordon. So we have one game where he's flashed a three-down skill set, and he looked great in that one game. And I think a lot of people believe that if Javante Williams were given the opportunity to be a bell cow running back, he could succeed in that role. But at this point, it's just a belief. We can't say it's a certainty. So I'm definitely going to still have Kenneth Walker and Damian Pierce over Javante, even if we're getting the good news. Now, dropping down to our next tier, we're going to go J.K. Dobbins at nine. I mean, Dobbins, obviously someone else who kind of won the NFL draft, right? And with J.K. Dobbins, he wasn't great this past season. I think I made the mistake in buying into him a little bit too early coming off that torn knee. So, I mean, at this point, I think Dobbins should be 100% healthy. He should be an offense that is great at running the football, even with the change in offensive coordinator. I think that they are going to run the ball a decent amount. And then with J.K. Dobbins, he was a strong, strong prospect coming out of Ohio State and much younger than a lot of people would assume. Now, going over to our next guy, yes, this is going to be higher than a lot of people have him. We will have Zach Charbonnet here. And like I said, I do not believe this is a situation in Seattle where it's a running back one, running back two, backfield. Instead, I think it's going to be that running back 1A, that running back 1B, and I think you'll see about a 60-40 split in Seattle with a team that, honestly, if Geno Smith can be good this next year, has so many damn weapons that their offense should be respectable. I mean, they should be a strong team top to bottom there, at least on the offensive side of the ball. Zach Charbonnet checks every single box that we look for. I mean, hell, this is a running back that has the size to be a three-down player, was a three-down player in college, caught the ball a ton in college, so he should be able to be used on third down. I think that's probably how they use him initially is Zach Charbonnet is the pass catcher. Kenneth Walker is the first and second down guy, or at least that's kind of how their profiles would be coming out of school. 
But nonetheless, he also had the athleticism we look for. And he goes in round two of the NFL draft. So Zach Charbonnet checks almost every single box that we have. If he found himself a much better landing spot, if he found himself in a situation where you didn't have a great running back on their rookie deal, I would have Zach Charbonnet higher than this. I could see if Zach Charbonnet found himself in a great situation instead of Seattle, him being ahead of Dobbins, him being ahead of Javante, him being ahead of Damian Pierce. But obviously because of the situation, we will have to move him down to 10. Now at 11, we're going to have Isaiah Pacheco. And right now, it looks to be a phenomenal situation for Isaiah Pacheco, right? I mean, it's the running back that dodges NFL free agency. He dodges the NFL draft for competition. They really just re-signed Jarrett McKinnon. They don't really do anything in this running back room. They clearly trusted him in the playoffs. And a lot of people are just kind of assuming here that Isaiah Pacheco is for sure not going to see added competition because it hasn't happened already. I'm a little bit hesitant with Isaiah Pacheco because there's still some sharks in the water, right? I mean, you still have Kareem Hunt swimming out there. You still have Leonard Fournette. You still have Ezekiel Elliott. I'm not saying that these running backs would be better than Isaiah Pacheco by any means, but I think if the Kansas City Chiefs were to decide to go through and add one of those backs, or maybe they make a play for like Dalvin, if Dalvin gets cut, then all of a sudden Isaiah Pacheco is just in a muddied backfield where it's probably going to be a running back by committee. He doesn't have a lot invested into him. He didn't catch the ball year one. The team doesn't really want to run the ball. So if we get to the beginning portion of the season and Isaiah Pacheco does not see anybody else go to his backfield by the time week one kicks off, then I will move Isaiah Pacheco slightly up this list. Now at 12, we're going to have Rashad White. I mean, with Rashad White, very inefficient year one, also going to be in a horrendous, horrendous offense. Clearly, you're just betting on the talent profile that he can catch the ball, right? You're really hoping that Rashad White's just going to be that third down guy. But I mean, the offense is going to be so bad. There's not really any touchdown upside here. Now, going to 13, I will add an extra little guy on this list because I know people are going to want to see him. DeAndre Swift. Now, yes, with DeAndre Swift, I know that we are lower on him than most. If you go through and read the article that we had on flockfantasy.com a few weeks back illustrating why you want to be selling DeAndre Swift, I think it will make a lot of sense in that this is a running back that has never seen the volume ever, ever, ever as a first and second down player. They do not give him carries. Multiple coaching staffs decided not to do that in Detroit. On top of this, with DeAndre Swift, his team was willing to give him up for a fourth round pick to go take Jameer Gibbs at 12 overall. And on top of this with DeAndre Swift, his major redeeming quality, the strongest thing of his profile in terms of his receiving down skill set is not going to be utilized to the fullest of its potential with a quarterback that can run the ball, or at least that's what we've historically seen from fantasy football perspective. But yeah, I, I understand that a lot of people will probably have Swift higher than this, but I'm just a seller of DeAndre Swift. But that's all I have for you. Again, thank you so much for being a member of the flock and supporting the channel. I really hope we were able to help you out in some way here. And as always, if there's anything that I can do for you, please do not hesitate to let me know. Really hope we get to see you with the video tomorrow. And if you want to join the flock, if you want to get access to my dynasty rankings, you want to get all the premium content of all your favorite dynasty fantasy football creators, you can find that on flockfantasy.com. With flockfantasy.com, sign up with promo code flock for 30% off any subscription. And on top of this, yours truly to go through and make a podcast breaking down your dynasty team. But thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Really do appreciate you and really do hope you have a great day.